All right. Well, thank you for that uh, that warm welcome. And it's certainly been my pleasure uh, working with Sujit on on this whole kind of uh, event and putting things together. So we're kind of going to jump into the slides here. And it's always interesting when we visit CWC and we look at wireless and we look at how do things fit together across time, right? And so one of the things I love about collaborating with academics is this focus on foundational technology. And it also causes us to, even as you're choosing who you're going to reference in your publication, an appreciation for what's already been done. So as we look forward, we always have to look past as well. And it's one of the reasons when we talk about these decades for every G, obviously it's not by magic that automatically every 10 years we say, oh my God, we got to invest in a new cellular uh, infrastructure upgrade. There's always a lot of questions on value, on the use cases, on how is this different? What's a software upgrade? What's a hardware upgrade? What's the new spectrum? But it's always exciting as well to realize so many things that are changing are not necessarily changing in core wireless. It's not like, oh my God, we're going to do 6G because OFDM is horrible. MIMO makes no sense and LDPC codes are bad. No, there's a lot of great stuff in 4G and 5G and 3G. But as we look forward, it's a little bit how we put these different ingredients to get together. And I would say it's one of those um, points that we have to think long enough term, recognizing that we're designing for the next decade from 2030 to 2040. And so just as we are in 2024, in the middle of this kind of key 5G era, as we look to 6G, we have to understand what will be the future of a connected hospital, a connected school, a connected factory. As Sujit mentioned, the role of smart transportation, how is AI and data centers going to change a lot of these use cases. So even as we speak right now, one of my, my colleagues, Lola, is at an SA1 workshop where they're talking about what are the 6G use cases? How does it all fit together? So it's really this industry accumulation of technical knowledge. And one of the other interesting points is how quickly 5G was deployed. So obviously, in the middle of the COVID era in 2020, 2021, there was a huge investment in these cellular networks. And we see so many operators, so many different types of devices, over 2 billion 5G smartphones already in the market. So it's just a great example of that energy. And it speaks to what I call the surface area of cellular. The amount of connectivity, the amount of, of notion of how often are you plugging something in to communicate versus you're doing it wirelessly. And so this huge appreciation for what's happening in the world of cellular. And then as we look at data, as Sujit mentioned, the role of AI is obviously transformative, particularly generative AI is changing so many different value propositions, huge amount of investment, huge change in people trying to predict you know, which companies are gonna be highly profitable because of this. But what's important to understand is what's a dichotomy? You know, what is a different way of looking at you know, computation in the cloud versus computation on device? And so when we look at edge cloud, that's obviously when wireless comes in. What are these devices communicating with each other? So kind of taking a little mini step, what I want to do is spend about maybe five minutes just quickly going through some examples of the latest technologies at this intersection of wireless and AI. So this was the Qualcomm you know, uh, X80 5G modem RF system. It's a good example, whether it's sub six or millimeter wave, you know, six carrier aggregation, six antennas, AI enabled uh, transmission modes. So much work went into enabling, uh, say, 10 gigabits per second downlink. I started at Qualcomm in 2000, um, and several of my colleagues in the room here, we were so excited to hit 2 megabits per second in 3G EVDO, and obviously LTE started around 100 megabits per second, whereas 5G came out of the gate around 3.5 or 5. And so it's not like we're doing continuous 5 gigabit per second transmissions, but it's really about how we slice time, how we slice frequency, even as we look at techniques like spectrum sharing, new ways of using time, frequency, space, antennas, and how does this all together kind of come together in a computing form factor? So as we talk of this kind of dichotomy and the role of hybrid AI, it's important to think, well, how much processing power is there in the integrated circuit that's in your smartphone today? So this is the 8 Gen 3, where we're also really focusing on the NPU capabilities, the CPU capabilities, the GPU capabilities, in addition to the wireless capabilities. And it's that point of how things come together. And really one of the themes of this conference is trying to look at, well, as AI is changing, how, do the, how does the wireless transmission requirements change? As you're doing AI processing at the edge, how many parameters can you process at the edge on the device? So that's a great example where we're all familiar with these large language models that are huge. Reality is these on-device AI processing can also handle billions and billions of parameters. And so this is another example, then you have that powerful AI for interesting applications that are not about wireless, 
And then you realize that obviously you can also do wireless AI processing itself within the modem. So several of these algorithms were brought forth as part of the x80. And this is just a good example where on the research side, we're always looking at what are these new AI techniques, understanding where 3GPP is going, and then saying, what are the KPIs we can improve by bringing together wireless and AI? So this was just more a technology proof point of something that's already commercial. And then another point about 5G is it's not just about scaling to even higher data rates, even lower latencies. It's also how do we bring in new cost structures? So even some of the discussions we'll have on the panel will focus on how about IoT as we're expanding into lower cost, lower tiers, uh, more like Cat 3, 100 megabit, 200 megabit per second type data rates, can we bring in a lower cost structure? So this was the X35 modem that's based on RedCap, which is a release 17 uh, 5G uh, capability. And it's really about specking something that's lower bandwidth, lower data rate. So it, it's kind of purposely containing it. Hence the uh, really innovative name, reduced capability is an exciting thing to talk about. Hey, do you have reduced capability? That sounds great. Um, so that's a little bit ironic, but it is this thing where X35 is red cap. And as uh, my good friends from AT&T and T-Mobile and the audience will attest, this also needs standalone. SA is part of red cap. And that's also something about bringing in the 5G core network and how all that fits together. So if we kind of turn our perspective then of powerful compute, um, one of the other interesting things is how do we look at the laptop? So I'm, you know, the laptop I'm using right now has a Qualcomm CPU, GPU, and NPU. So the same sort of chip architectures that can go into a phone, well, you can repurpose that and say, okay, let's design an amazingly power efficient ARM-based processor. And so this was the X Elite, and we were really excited um, to literally announce last week all of these different laptop models that have the Qualcomm processor. And this is more just a testament to where is the role of edge AI? Where is the role of edge processing? So from a semiconductor standpoint, from an RF integration standpoint, from a baseband integration standpoint, an overall end-to-end -end multimedia AI, wireless and compute coming together, well, how can we make these sort of new form factors? And what are some of the generative AI models that can be supported? So one of the exciting things is just how fast AI is changing. And so there's often, um, when we talk about the 4G to 5G transition or the 3G to 4G transition, one of the big things that was different was the cloud. So it's not like, oh, you, you couldn't do the cloud without 4G. But the point is during that 4G to 5G era in 2010 through 2020, the role of the cloud became so much more uh, important, which is why we're often talking about software defined networking, network function virtualization, cloud architectures for RAN. So cloud RAN or cloud core based implementations. So it's that point that as AI is moving, so much of the technology industry has to really stay plugged in because how it changes will affect how we design future wireless systems. And a great example of something that's always going to need wireless connectivity is vehicular communications. So from the network to a vehicle, for any of you who've recently bought a car, obviously uh, it has cellular capability in it. And it's always this interesting reality of what is the user data where you could be streaming, you know, navigation type information. But what about the data that's about how efficient the, the vehicle is, stuff tied to navigation, stuff tied to, you know, more uh, predictive maintenance schedules for the actual vehicle. So as we look at smart transportation, as we look at smart city, it's also an interesting reality that that edge processing and that role of communications are intertwined and you kind of put them all together. And then one of the other interesting things is the changing role of RAN itself, the radio access network, the role of macro cells, pico cells, femto cells, uh, the role of how we do disaggregation, how we look at that overall implementation. And so that's another important part of the continuing evolution of wireless. And also what's better served by Wi-Fi versus cellular. And that's another interesting thing that we always challenge ourselves on as we're arguing about, hey, what do we have to do differently in 6G than 5G? It's also a discussion of, hey, when does Wi-Fi make sense? Because uh, Wi-Fi itself, we have to acknowledge, is moving incredibly quickly as well. A lot of work already starting on discussion of Wi-Fi 8, obviously Wi-Fi 7 uh, being product announced already. And it's an interesting reality that as we look at indoor, as we look at outdoor, as we look at different use cases, and obviously every single device is essentially multi-mode between cellular and Wi-Fi. And so how we do that interworking, how we do that kind of uh, aggregation or different ways of, of handling both air interfaces. So that's also always an interesting one that the world of wireless, the role of UWB, the role of Bluetooth, the role of Wi-Fi 
are intertwined with how we look at evolving 5G and 6G. And I would say one of the other things, and you'll see some of this in the demonstrations today, is that from an academic standpoint, being able to work with actual physical devices. So one of the things we've learned uh, is that people want to get their hands dirty in a lab working on real tech. And so whether it's looking at AI on device or whether it's looking at, hey, I'd want to do some heterogeneous computing, not just with you know cloud GPU, but actually I want to do something with CPU, NPU, and GPU and look into some different processing. So that's an example where we're able to do that, uh, for example, using the AI hub or the QIDK. So this is just an example, whether it's robotics or augmented virtual reality, how we look at those platforms is also something where we're seeing a lot of new engagement models with universities. And I think working with Sujit on this summit, that was also an exciting point that how academia and how the National Science Foundation and, and even globally, uh, whether it's you know universities in India or Europe, this broader view of technology innovation and what is the platform for that? How does it tie to a real world constraint? And I think if you think of engineering versus you know physics or chemistry, uh, one of the interesting things, engineering is always a constrained optimization. It's about what are the externalities that make a trade-off make more sense than a different trade-off. And so this is something that really exposes it when you're forced to do it on, on device. And hence those discussion of you know, on-device AI versus cloud AI. So just a quick kind of reminder to everyone, we're basically um, you know, already started release 19 and release 18 is finished. So 5G, you know, started with the release 15 work item and before that the release 14 study item. So we kind of had the first half of 5G and now we're clearly in the second half of 5G from a standardization standpoint. And so putting this together, it's incredibly important that across industry and academia, we're already thinking very kind of challenging ourselves and what does it make sense to do for 6G? Where do we do an evolutionary approach? Where do we do a revolutionary approach? How does it all fit together? And it's that point, of going back to the surface area, it's incredible what's been, been accomplished in, in 3GBP as we looked at that role of different types of, whether it's satellite communications, vehicular communications, a lot of focus in the early days. Uh, and then seeing Misha in the audience here, I remember are talking about you know, tactile internet and high reliability, low latency, and how, what can you do on wireless that you used to do on ethernet? The role of then kind of industrial grade wireless cellular and how you bring you know, literally SLAs into that equation as you're looking at guaranteed reliability and latency, a multi-dimensional trade-off. So all of this kind of speaks to the complexity and the tool chain that as engineers we bring to this challenge. And that's what's so exciting as we look across the different panels and discussions today, we're trying to expose some of that trade-off, whether it's for you know, digital twins or whether it's for smart cities or whether it's for vehicular communication how do these different trade-offs across this growing surface area of applications, how does it make sense? And kind of if we were to summarize a couple of the key areas in the next uh, you know, four, uh, three to four years, 2024 to 2027, you know, the role of AIML, the role of REDCap, uh, the role of performance enhancements, the role of NTN, we'll have some good discussions on satellite. These are just examples of out of that huge sphere of um, you know, 5G evolution out of 3GPP, pragmatically, what are some of the key things we want to work on as an industry? And this kind of brings us to this perspective. What do we want to focus on in the 6G era? What do we think is going to move the needle? And so we have a lot of these existential discussions, um, even with some of my colleagues from Apple, early, like earlier at the, uh, the coffee hour before these talks, we was kind of talking about what do we want to change in 6G? And it's interesting because you start looking at the capabilities and in 5G, we had the famous triangle for mobile broadband, massive IoT, and critical IoT. Whereas in 6G, we're taking a little bit of a step back and saying, well, let's think a little bit about these capabilities, these KPIs. What do we want to drive to? And saying, well, let's talk about sensing. So RF sensing is incredibly important. Obviously, it ties into how we use spectrum. Can we better understand spectrum utility? We know we're going to need to share spectrum between government users and commercial users. We're going to need to share spectrum between different applications. So how we use sensing, how we embed that into the network, and then the capabilities of these devices to do multiple bands of RF processing, they're also sensors. So that's a great example of what we call integrated sensing and communications. How does that fit into 6G? Well, then how do we look at resiliency in the 6G era? How do we look at operational efficiency? Every operator we discuss 6G with is very quick to remind us, hey, this is all great. Love the PowerPoint. What can we do about operational efficiency, OPEX cost? And we totally get that. And that's that point of 
well, what can we do going back to legacy bands? How can we improve FDD? So huge focus area. Can we bring in some interesting new tech into improving bands between one and two gigahertz or bands like 600 megahertz, 700 megahertz, 900 megahertz, bringing those into the 2030s for tech that was kind of more, um, you could argue 20 years old in terms of the original deployments or even older for some of those bands. So that really forces us to look critically at the antenna side, at the RF processing side, the level of integration and how we really look at the role of antennas and beamformings and, and arrays on the network side and the device side. And so these are just some of those kind of core KPIs that are a little different. And this is part of the ITU framework. We're kind of putting together this broad view of 6G use cases, 6G KPIs, and saying, yeah, coverage, capacity, latency. I know Roberto Padovani uh, would participate in this workshop many times. And, and when we were discussing in his office the early days of 5G, we talked of like the, the so-called vectors of innovation. And the interesting point of every cellular big one, there was the, the big three of coverage and capacity and latency. And the point is 5G expanded that and said, well, let's really think critically about reliability. Let's really think critically about some of these new dimensions. And so how do we bring sustainability into the discussion right away? That's definitely a global um, you know, goal we're hearing from every single region. And we also understand that the role of the cellular generations and the, the investment is also about public-private partnership. It's about understanding from a given society's connectivity needs, from a government needs, how do they look at the operators? How do they look at the spectrum? How do they look at evolution? And that's where sustainability and the efficiency of the networks is incredibly important. And so kind of, and then I would argue, putting these together is what makes kind of the fun of 6G different. We have new tools, we have new building blocks, we have amazing new research coming out of academia, and we have another huge step forward in terms of on-device AI, cloud architectures, and the role of AI itself. And so this is my last slide, and it's, you'll see some of these demos today, but it's that perspective of when we're pushing these boundaries, what can we change, and what's interesting from a use case improvement standpoint, uh, whether it's you know, pushing 5G advanced forward or looking at some of these foundational models. So I wanted to um, you know, thank you all for, for letting me do this keynote, and I think it's something where, this is uh, ironic, I can read this all to us, a good example of uh, the safety of today's world. Um, but it kind of brings me to introducing our, our next speaker, which is going to be Rob Sony, and it, just before our next panel. And so it's within that perspective that we're looking broadly at what are the challenges in the next five years and what's the state of 5G. And so, Rob, we look forward to your talk, and then uh, we'll begin the panel. But thank you very much.